Good morning, Your Honors. Supreme Court erred at the outset by assuming that the plaintiffs had standing to challenge this regulation in the first place. Certainly none of the plaintiffs here have been threatened with an isolation or quarantine order, so any accusations about how this order would operate in conflict of statute or conflict with due process would be speculative. As to the Boreali challenge, the organizational plaintiff and the legislator plaintiffs both refer only to the generic harm to the general public that arises from such violations. The organization refers to its ability to advocate without any specific or personalized allegations as to why they can't advocate for their priorities due to this rule's mere existence. As for the legislators, the legislators are referring only to the fact that a Borealli violation in the abstract is a usurpation of the legislative power. But the Court of Appeals in Silver and Silver's progeny both make clear that legislative standing requires more. Like any other plaintiff, legislators need personalized <coughs> allegations of harm. And it is not enough to allege harm to the legislative body itself and to then rely on their status of member, as members. What we're seeing from the plaintiffs is basically an attempt to make Boreali into some sort of magic word as they see it in this virtually limitless view of standing. If they raise the, a Boreali claim, virtually anyone and certainly any legislator could challenge any regulation with which they disagree. The Court of Appeals has not embraced a view of standing that's that broad. If anything, they've said that legislative standing is limited. And that's why this court should reject such a broad theory. If this court were to review the merits, Supreme Court erred on the merits as well. Virtually all of Supreme Court's reasoning boils down to a misconception that isolation and quarantine is synonymous with civil commitment. It's not. The defining feature of civil commitment is physical restraint. You are taken against your will to a place where you cannot leave. We acknowledge that PHL 2120, which is the law on which Supreme Court relied, provides for a civil commitment process and it also provides for protections. But where Supreme Court errs is in finding that there's a conflict with that statute. If you look at the text of Rule 2.13, there's nothing in that text that invariably leads to the conclusion that the Department of Health can somehow take people away from the community and lock them up in situations where they can't leave. It's true that the Department of Health can order a person to isolate and quarantine, but the Department of Health can order many people and many entities to do all kinds of things. I'll note that 2.13G contains mechanisms for enforcement. It says anybody who violates one of these orders is going to be subject to any enforcement action available to the Department of Health under law. If this were civil commitment, we wouldn't have needed to put an enforcement mechanism in because you just wouldn't be able to leave. The door would be locked, or if you tried to run away, somebody would physically restrain you. And the fact that that rule says the enforcement mechanisms available under law is an additional signal that anything the department can do has to be consistent with the governing law. We acknowledge that if one of those mechanisms is to physically remove somebody to a hospital, the one and only way that the department or a locality can effectuate that is by following the procedure set forth in 2120. Now, I hope that one day nobody ever decides to try and commit somebody and claim 2.13 as the authority to do so. If that day ever comes, who, the affected person would have a very strong challenge that the order of isolation and quarantine <coughs> itself is unauthorized. But that's not this challenge. This is a facial challenge that rests on the premise that PHL 2120 somehow is the sole legislative policy announced on isolation and quarantine, which was puzzling considering that 2120 doesn't use the phrases isolation and quarantine at all. It uses the phrase commitment. But there are other statutes like 2100, 2180, Chapter 25 of the Laws of 2020 
they do use the phrases isolation and quarantine, <laughs> and they don't reference 2120. So if that was the only mechanism, those statutes would be rendered superfluous. In addition, this conception of 2120 undercuts plaintiff's own argument, or a key feature of it, which is that this rule is invalid, but the rules that it superseded somehow are valid. Those rules, likewise, allowed localities to issue orders of isolation and quarantine. Those rules did not cross-reference 2020. So if plaintiffs were correct, and if Supreme Court were correct, it means that the counties and the state have been going about this all wrong for the better part of 50 years and violating the legislative intent, which is also why this internal inconsistency with their argument undercuts their separation of powers claim. It's quizzical that over 50 years, if the department and the localities were violating legislative intent, that the legislature wouldn't have stepped in and amended the PHL to try and rein in that authority, but they haven't. And in addition, in defending the former rules, plaintiffs can't do that without acknowledging that the department has the authority to promulgate rules governing the subject matter of isolation and quarantine in the first place, which is what Boreali is all about. The fault line between the old rules and the rule at issue here is that 2.13 clarifies that the Department of Health, in addition to localities, can sign isolation and quarantine orders. That might be an allegation of statutory conflict. We allege or we argue that that is just not true. 2100 refers to all health officers without qualification. PHL 242 and 243 make clear health officers can be DOH employees. And in general, the public health law bestows upon the Department of Health the primary responsibility to control infectious diseases and in fact lets the Department of Health oversee the localities. So if the legislature had wanted only localities to have this responsibility in this particular instance, we would expect unambiguous language, not something that's open to interpretation. Nonetheless, getting back to Boreali, it illustrates that what this rule does is exactly what interstitial rulemaking is supposed to be doing. This rule is clarifying health officers mean the state or localities. It's clarifying that when PHL 2100 refers to the control of persons infected or exposed, here's what that means. Isolation is if you're infected. Quarantine is if you're exposed. They both last only so long as to limit the spread of disease. That's exactly what's supposed to be happening. But counsel, isn't there supposed to be some type of time limitation on how long that's supposed to be happening? I didn't see that. I didn't see that. It's, where is the, the, the term of confinement? It's, it doesn't determine where the term of confinement is. Are there definite time frames for the confinement in Rule 2.13? So, Your Honor, just first off, I would take issue with the characterization of this as confinement. This is not confinement or civil commitment, but 2.13b requires that the order is going to include an expected duration. The definitions of isolation and quarantine in 2.2i and j say that they can last only so long as is necessary to prevent or limit the spread of disease. So in 2.13b, whoever's issuing that order is going to provide an estimate for what they expect that period to be. That, of course, is going to be subject to the monitoring of the person and making sure that their symptoms have abated if the symptoms last so just, longer. Real quick, just looking at the, the regulation, it, its exact language, and following up to Justice Ogden's question, any isolation or quarantine order shall specify the duration of the order. Yes. It's not an estimate, correct? Yes. So there's going to be a duration in there. I guess what I'm saying as far as reconciling it is that if the symptoms last longer, that would have to be effectuated by way of a new order that okay. in turn would specify a duration because every order has to include a duration under 2.13b. There's been an allegation that this rule is some sort of backdoor effort to enact A416, a failed assembly bill, it's well settled that the failure of one bill in one house hardly is going to be indicative of efforts of the legislature to reach a compromise on this issue and then an agency is sort of swooped in and pulled the rug out from under them. Nevertheless, you can find the text of this rule on pages 116 through 119 of the record. 
if you read through that, you will see this bill is a commitment bill. So even if we had evidence that a critical mass of legislators opposed the proposition for committing people under the circumstances set forth in that bill, it has no light on what they would think about 2.13, which doesn't provide for commitment. With Mr. Just one, la one last question for me anyways is um, specifically which section or sections of the public health law does the state rely upon to authorize this particular regulation? We rely on PHL 2100, which provides that health officers can control persons who are infected or exposed. A anything else. I just want to get the list that you oh, okay. have, if you have one. If it's just 2100, I'll, I'll be it's sure It's 2100, look. and it is PHL 225-5J, which provides that the sanitary code shall Give include 225-5J. And that, that's the regulation governing what's going to be in the sanitary code. I know that there was an argument raised that we were invoking 5A, which is a generalized power over all matters related to public health. That certainly supports this rule, but 5J is more specific. It says the sanitary code shall include measures regarding the contact and communication with infected premises that is reasonably read, certainly in conjunction with 2100, to relate to who can enter and leave those premises. Council, so what does 5A permit? 5A permits the department to regulate all matters related to public health. But you're not relying on 5A is what you just indicated because you find that 5J is more specific, correct? Yes. I mean, certainly 5A supports it, but we wouldn't put all our eggs into the 5A basket when we have more specific rules. Okay. Do you have anything further? Yes, Your Honor. With respect to the fourth Borealli factor and the claim that this violates due process, the text of the rules themselves resolve both of those issues because they show that isolation and quarantine is related solely to public health considerations the very definitions of isolation and quarantine are anchored to public health. There's no question that the department is the arm of the state that has the expertise in public health. With respect to due process, once again, we're at this point where they're conflating commitment with isolation and quarantine and saying that the standards for commitment should apply. Federal courts have said that that simply isn't the case. We're very well aware that federal courts do not bind this court but plaintiffs haven't shed any light on why those decisions wouldn't be persuasive. Instead, they argue that due process is more lenient for, for regulations than it is for statutes and that the standard should be shock the conscience. But the Court of Appeals has said for substantive due process purposes, the standard is actually quite deferential. It's whether a law or a regulation is enacted for a public purpose and reasonably related to that purpose. Undoubtedly, this is a measure that's designed to operate in the event of an outbreak or pandemic of communicable diseases. Finally, I know that the claim was for substantive due process, but Supreme Court ventured into procedural due process. I want to point out to the court that any available enforcement mechanism, whether it's trying to get fines, whether it's the criminal process, whether it is a commitment proceeding under 2120, all of those enforcement mechanisms have due process protections of their own that are just not in dispute as far as their adequacy. And judicial oversight? So judicial oversight is in all of those enforcement mechanisms. And finally, in the regulation itself, for those people who want to oppose an order of isolation and quarantine, but don't want to disobey it, there's judicial review and a right to counsel there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. If it pleases the court, my name is Bobby Ann Flower Cox. I'm here on behalf of the plaintiffs. I have my lead plaintiff with me here today, Senator George Borrello. Um, I, I think we got a little bit off track here. Um, I'm going to pull us back on track. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is uh, get on the record what this regulation actually says. Uh, and then I'll go into the, the 
some of the details on how it conflicts with our existing. We certainly don't need to read the regulation to us. We're no, no, no. I'm not going to read it. I'm not going to read it. Um, so, Rule 2.13 gave the Commissioner of Health the, the unbridled power to pick and choose which New Yorkers she could lock up. I'm saying she because at the time it was Dr. Mary Bassett. She could lock up or lock down. Um, she didn't have to prove you were sick. She didn't have to prove you were exposed to a communicable disease. She didn't have to prove you were a health threat. She could issue an isolation or quarantine order at whim. Uh, it didn't have to be a state of emergency. That quarantine order or that isolation order would determine how long you were in lockup or lockdown. Uh, they could have locked you up in your home or they could have removed you from your home with the force of police as clearly delineated in 2.13. Uh, with the force of police, they could have removed you from your home and put you into a detention center, a facility, whatever you'd like to call it, whatever noun you choose, it gets you to the same place. It's not your home and you don't get to pick where you go. They could have locked you up there for however long they wanted, no restrictions, days, weeks, months. There was no age restriction. So they could have done this to you, but they also could have done this to your child or your grandchild or your elderly parent. Um, the provision said that they could tell you what you could and couldn't do while you were in lockup or lockdown. They could use the police in order to make sure you were abiding by their, their isolation or quarantine order. And uh, if you disobeyed, you would be subject to either civil penalties, which could be up to $2,000 per day, and each day that you disobeyed their order was a new violation. So if you disobey their order for 10 days, that's $20,000 in, in fines. Is there a cap? It, I, I believe it was up to $2,000, yes, Your Honor. Um, and so there was the civil aspect, and then there was also the fact, that, the fact that they could use criminal penalties against you if you disobeyed one of their isolation or quarantine orders. And when we were at the trial court last year, uh, doing oral arguments, the trial court judge specifically asked, uh, if you issue me an isolation or a quarantine order and I disobey, I don't want to go, um, can you get the police to come and arrest me and, and take me to a facility somewhere? And the attorney general's response was a resounding, yes, we can. That's what the regulation says we can do. So that's my overview of the regulation. Uh, it severely conflicts with the public health law. Okay, specifically, the lower court did not err when it struck down this regulation saying that it violated, conflicts with, section 2120 of the public health law, which since 1953 has been our isolation and quarantine law. In 1953, the New York State Legislature weighed what they had, they weighed the, the rights of the individual against the government interest in keeping our society safe. And they came up with this law, which is full of due process protections. But Council, did it really conflict with 2120 or did it exceed the powers delegated to the, the Department of Health by the legislature? It, it, it's both, Your Honor. It's both. So the lower court uh, ruled that and struck down this regulation because, yes, it conflicts with Section 2120 of the public health law. It also conflicts with Section 2100 and Section 12 and 12-A and 12-B, but primarily uh, the provisions of Section 2120, which is our quarantine law, um, are violated significantly by this regulation. And, and in making, in promulgating this regulation, uh, the lower court also found correctly that the Department of Health overstepped their bounds. Um, we, we use Boreale in our analysis because that is what the Court of Appeals says to use. When, when you are trying to figure out, in New York State, when you're trying to figure out if an agency has overstepped their bounds and crossed into that legislative, lawmaking, policy-making realm, you use the four prongs of Boreale. Um, and, and opposing counsel doesn't contest that. They, they use Boreale themselves. It's just that they argue that Boreale favors them. They, they think all four prongs of Boreale favor them. The trial court below has already said that the three of the four prongs of Boreale uh, clearly favor our side. And that fourth prong, he did not rule against us on the fourth prong. He simply said it didn't weigh in favor of either side. 
Um, however, in arguing Boreali, they say it works for them, we say it works for us. The whole premise of Boreali is it's only used as a test to determine whether or not an agency has overstepped their realm. And so, yes, to answer your question, the lower court said, we're striking this down because it conflicts with Section 2120 and, it, and an agency cannot make a regulation that conflicts with a law, which the Attorney General does not contest that. They, they actually say it in their own papers, both here on appeal and at the lower court level. They acknowledge that agencies have to have an enabling statute or statutes to give them the power to make a regulation. And in this case, they did not have one. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly they did not have one. If I could just point out a couple of the glaring um, um, conflicts between Rule 2.13 and, and Section 2120 of the Public Health Law, I do have a chart um, that I put in my brief, which starts on page 13. I will direct the court to that. Um, for It starts on page 13 and it runs, I think, till page 15 or 16, because uh, there are, are a lot of differences between these this regulation and the law. Um, but I just want to go over a couple of the main differences to point out to the court today. Um, first of all, our law, which we've had for 70 years, says that in order to even consider isolating or quarantining somebody from society, um, they have to first actually have the communicable disease that we're talking about here. Whereas Rule 2.13, there is no need for the Department of Health to prove that you are infected or exposed to a communicable disease. That is very clear in the language. Um, the second thing that I want to point out on the conflicts is that once a, a doctor, according to the law, confirms that you actually are sick, and if they are concerned that you can't keep your germs to yourself, in essence, um, then the doctor would refer the matter to the local health authority. The local health authority, not the commissioner of state. The local health authority would then, if they think that there's a possible problem here with this person, they would start an investigation. And they gather their evidence, and if, at the end of gathering their evidence, they think, yes, we have a problem here, this person is infected and is a public health threat, two-pronged test, then they refer it to a magistrate. And a magistrate, a third-party, unbiased judge, gets to look at the evidence, there is a hearing, the, the person is uh, afforded an attorney if they cannot afford one, and um, there's due notice that a hearing is coming up. Whereas the regulation says they can knock on your door with no due notice and they can hand you an isolation or a quarantine order. Ex parte, no hearing, no due notice, no right to have an attorney before you get locked up or locked down in your house, no right to contest any sort of evidence against you. There is no evidence against you because there's no hearing provided in Rule 2.13. It says you have the right to an attorney and judicial review after you're locked up, right? It's, it's, it's guilty until proven innocent. It's yeah, tremendous. We understand that. Okay, sorry, getting a little emotional, <laughs> sorry. Um, so just one other thing on the conflict between the rule and, and um, the law, Section 2120 of the Public Health Law, is that the law clearly says that if the judge determines that yes, you are infected and yes, you are a public health threat, you can't or you won't comport yourself in a manner to protect those around you, then they can issue an isolation or a quarantine order and put you into a hospital for care so you can get better. <laughs> that is not what the rule says. The rule says the commissioner of health can pick any place that the commissioner of health wants to put you. You have no say. And including the words uh, residential or, quote, residential or temporary housing. So it's a stark contrast to our law, which we've had for 70 years, which sets out the policy that our legislature carefully weighed the rights and the concern of the government and then came up with this law. So that's that's what I wanted to say on, on the reg itself and on the um, differences between the reg and section 2120 of the public health law. We do also put Council, forth, yes. Uh, forgive my interruption, but uh, 
the other side indicated that they were relying on section 2100 of the public health law. Mm. There's two bases, 2100, and secondly, 225. 5J. Mm -hmm. Yes. 5A was probably too broad, albeit to provide support. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what about 5J? Doesn't that seem to provide for this kind of regulation? Uh, no, Your Honor, it doesn't. Um, so, not? first, I'd like to point out that their enabling statute has been a moving target, and we've been litigating this case for a year and a half now. Well, we um, just heard two. Yeah, we just heard two. Okay, so I'll go with those two because all the other ones they've cited. And for my purposes, all I'm asking for is about 225, 5J. <clears throat> okay. So it talks about established regulations in respect to contact or communication with or use of infected premises, places, or, or things. Yes, exactly. So Does it apply to people? I'm sorry? Does it apply to people? It does not, Your Honor. No, no. Um, and in uh, with statutory construction, um, as your honors know, uh, we are compelled to first look at the actual verbiage that's used in a statute to interpret the legislative intent of the statute. So before we even start going through the archives and seeing, well, you know, what were the debates like when on, on the Senate floor and the assembly floor to see what did the legislature intend, we first look at the actual language. And, and obviously we two, were well aware of that. Yes, no, 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 I know. Yes, thank you. Um, 225 5J says nothing about isolating or quarantining human beings. Um, so it, it says they can establish regulations um, in respect to contact or communication with or use of infected premises, places, or things. That's it. So uh, opposing counsel saying, well, that automatically kind of would assume that, they can, that we can regulate uh, people that go in and out of those places is absurd. I mean, it doesn't even pass the straight face argument here. When countless cases from the Court of Appeals have held that when the legislature wants to delegate their power to an agency, they have to speak clearly, especially in the area of constitutional rights. So if the legislature wanted to pass uh, a law that enables the Department of Health to make a regulation that allows them to arbitrarily pick out New Yorkers with no proof they're sick, with no proof they've posed a threat to other people, with no hearing beforehand, no notice, no, a, no right to an attorney to represent them before they get locked up, then it's not in the public health law. If they wanted to make it a provision in the public health law, they could easily do that. And in fact, A416, which opposing counsel brings up, did try to do that. That bill was proposed since 2015. It came about because of an Ebola outbreak and a New York City uh, member of the assembly proposed this A416. It had prior numbers beforehand, but most recently it was A416. And for seven years, from 2015 straight through December of 2021, A416 was proposed in the New York State Assembly. It is the same sum and substance, which the lower court did agree, the same sum and substance as Rule 2.13 that the Department of Health has issued in this case. It got no support whatsoever. It was proposed in the, the New York State Assembly Health Committee for seven years in a row. It never made it onto the agenda of the Health Committee. I think we understand that. Okay. It, it never went anywhere, is my bottom line. <laughs> it didn't have a sister uh, proposed we law <laughs> in the Senate. And um, the amicus brief that was submitted last year at trial court, which is part of the record um, before your honors, um, which was authored by Assemblyman Andy Goodell, gives a very detailed analysis of the treatment of A416. Um, if you're interested, that is in, in the record before you. Um, so I think it's clear that <laughs> The Department of uh, Appellants do not like our current New York State law, our policy on how we remove people from society if they are a public health threat. They don't like Section 2120 of the public health law. They think it's not good enough in, the, in time of emergency. And they have made that very clear at both at the trial court level and here on appeal. 
Um, at the trial court level, when we had oral arguments last year, the Attorney General's office was crystal clear. In essence, this pandemic has shown us that we can't have, uh, you know, all these different courts around the state, you know, deciding if someone should be isolated or quarantined. You know, we need to centralize power. We need, here in Albany, Commissioner of Health, we need to centralize power and be able to control 19 million New Yorkers I think we have the flick of a pen, right? So if they want to change the law, if they want to change the public health law and make it more centralized, if they want to take out the due process protections that are currently in our quarantine law, all they need to do is ask the legislature to change the law. It's very simple. The Constitution provides three branches of government. Legislative branch is the one that's supposed to make law. So if the Department of Health wants to change policy and change the law, no problem. Pedal your goods to the, to the New York State Legislature and see if they'll change it. One last thing I want to just point out is our overarching question here on appeal is really, does the Department of Health have to follow New York State law when they want to remove someone from society who is a public health threat? And the overwhelming question, that the answer to that overwhelmingly clear question is, yes, of course the Department of Health has to follow law if they want to remove somebody from society because they feel that they're a public health threat. They, if they don't have to follow the law, then what's the point of having the New York State Legislature? Um, and as far as standing is concerned, um, you know, <laughs> Silver v. Pataki, which is a Court of Appeals case, which is relied on heavily by opposing counsel, um, clearly says, when it's, when it's read and cited properly, uh, clearly says that the judicial branch will always be available to, to resolve disputes between the other two branches of government when the other two branches of government are combating who has what power and who can do what. That is very clearly stated by the Court of Appeals in Silver v. Pataki. That court also said that if you are a legislator and you feel that you have been wronged by another branch of government because your power was either, your vote was nullified or your power was usurped by another branch of government, you have standing. Silver v. Pataki makes it clear, and there are other Court of Appeals cases, but this is the one that opposing counsel relies upon, makes it clear, legislators have standing, and, and you only need one legislator. You don't have to have, Silver v. Pataki says that as well, you don't have to have the whole legislature on board. Even just one legislator has standing to sue if he or she thinks that their power has been usurped by another branch or their vote has been nullified. And since day one, we have been arguing that the power of the legislators has been usurped. That's the only reason you use Boreale. Yeah, I think we understand that. So if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. Um, if Thank you do you. not, then I rest on my brief. Thank you very much. Should I wait a moment? I assume most of these people don't want to stay in here. <laughs> You're more than welcome to stay if you'd like to listen to all the other continue with court. <laughs>